Hello, I'm Melody. Welcome to Myanmar Today Review, and this is where we visit the top stories for this week from Myanmar Today. Here are the reports from our reporters from this week. Art House to organize more online exhibitions to be flexible trend. China's COVID-19 vaccines human trials. Businesses in Yangon partly resumes their operations. Global apparel demand drops and Myanmar garments. Before we get to the reports, let's take a look at the feature local news from this week. State Councilor Do Aung San Suu Kyi held a video conference on Tuesday from the Presidential Palace in Nipido with U Aung Tu, the Deputy Minister for Comrades, Do Win Win Thin, City Mart Managing Director, who is involved in the domestic trade supply, and Do Thet Su Te, SME entrepreneur, who is producing and distributing natural tamarind and jujube juice, fried beans, and thick brown sauce about the impacts on the trade and comrade sector by the COVID-19. The state councilor briefed the subject of discussion about the impacts on the trade and commerce sector by the COVID-19, and she stressed the requirements for the trade sector of the country, such as engage in multi-markets instead of relying on only a few markets for the agricultural products of the country to export. Firstly, U Aung Tu, the Deputy Minister for Commerce, discussed the impacts on the trade and commerce sector in three parts such as effects on the trade sector caused by COVID-19. Next, Do Win Win Thin, who is the City Mart Managing Director, discussed in four parts including the impacts on the domestic wholesale and retail sector at the onset of COVID-19. Next, Do Thet Su Te, who is the SME entrepreneur, discussed the impact on almost the whole supply chain of the business, challenges to survive the business, efforts for fulfilling the requirements of employees, and expressed her upset for laying off and thanks for the SME loans which facilitated to solve the problem of paying salary and wages for the employees. Commander-in-Chief of Defense Services, Senior General Mei Aung-Line, together with Myanmar Demidol delegation members, attended the parade held in Moscow's Red Square to commemorate the 75th anniversary Victory Day of Great Patriotic War in the Russian Federation on Wednesday. Russian President Vladimir Putin, Defense Minister Army General Sergei Kuzuketovich Shoigu, senior military and civilian officials, military veterans, presidents from 12 countries and military heads, defense ministers and senior officers from 19 countries, and invited guests attended the ceremony. U So Han, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, called in Mr. Manjuru Karam Khan Chowdhury, ambassador of Bangladesh to Myanmar, on Wednesday at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Nipido. During the meeting, they exchanged views on matters pertaining to bilateral relations and implementation of bilateral agreements regarding the displaced persons. The permanent secretary reiterated the need to strictly adhere to the bilateral agreements reached between the two countries for repatriation. He suggested that both sides will coordinate for the holding of the joint working group meeting once the situation of COVID-19 is under control. And I believe it's time now for our first report. Painting market has been affected a great deal by COVID-19 ever since the exhibitions are prohibited. But the art house in Myanmar has organized more online exhibitions. In this way, the galleries have transformed the physical exhibitions into online exhibitions. It can be said that the golden era of painting in Myanmar just before the COVID-19 outbreak. In Yango, every week showcase at least one exhibition. Some galleries have exhibition even twice a week. More than 9 to 10 paintings were sold out in every exhibition, according to Mapyong Zali. 
Most of the artists can take advantage of the stay-home period by creating more artworks on their own. But some would like to have outdoor arts, so this pandemic caused a big problem in their profession. Painting market is affected by COVID-19 a lot, since the exhibitions are prohibited. There are no customers, and some artists find difficulties in their living. Mat Byung Zali is the founder and CEO of Artist Mind at House, which is operating art school, art clubs, galleries, and also art material shops. Speaking to Amber Radio about the impacts of global pandemic on art house, she said. When the pandemic occurs, every gallery in Myanmar, of course, including Artist My Art House, has been closed and we cannot arrange the exhibition. So we arranged to create an online exhibition at the beginning of May. We collected the soft file of the paintings from any artists who want to display their artworks at online exhibition. We also sold these paintings at the online exhibition, but the artists have to donate 100% of the profit from selling the paintings. The exhibition includes 118 male and female artists for 85 paintings. 45 paintings are just sold out through this online exhibition. We have grossed over 1,400,000 just as fund. We can support 71 artists, 118,000 just per artist. So we can say that our online exhibition was successful. This way we have transformed the trend. Since then, we have seen that many galleries have organized the online exhibitions. 75 for 75th is an online art exhibition to commemorate the birthday anniversary of state councillor Do Aung San Suu Kyi. U Jo Shina, assistant director of National Museum Django, is also one of the organizers for the exhibition. He told Emma Radio about the first online exhibition organized by National Museum Django. <laughs> Generally, we can classify three types of exhibition, industrial exhibition, regional exhibitions, and universal exhibition. We have been working on traditional physical exhibition. The online exhibition is a kind of universal exhibition as everyone in the world can watch the exhibition without limiting show time. Even when the pandemic occurs, we have upgraded the physical exhibition into online too in conformity with universal system, but it needs advanced technology. In case the commemorative birthday at exhibition was arranged to display at National Museum of Myanmar in Yangon. So the exhibition has been transformed into online show due to COVID-19 outbreak. Dr. Dokin Meiji, who is an artist, speaking to Emma Radio about her opinion on the pros and cons of the online exhibition, she said. In the past time, we exhibit our artwork at a gallery, which had limit in shooting space and also people could look in detail about the artwork. But during the COVID-19 outbreak, we have to introduce a new platform in exhibiting our artwork so that the audience can accept and enjoy with a single click and also increase the audience reach even to worldwide. Now the galleries are getting along with the modernized methods of exhibiting and new marketplace for sales. Currently, every seller is keeping abreast with the trend to be in conformity with new normal condition and technology, so the art house does. I am Jyoti Ritu. This is news reporting from MI Radio. That's the report on Art House to organize more online exhibitions to be flexible trend. China's Medical Products Administration has given green light to five Chinese coronavirus vaccines for human trials, and this is according to the Ministry of Science and Technology. More vaccines are expected to get approval for clinical trials soon. The report covers the update on China's vaccine development and the update on the confirmed cases globally.
Agacho has all the details. China's Medical Products Administration has given green light to five Chinese coronavirus vaccines for human trials, according to the Ministry of Science and Technology. More vaccines are expected to get approval for a clinical trial soon. Scientists around the globe are racing for a vaccine for COVID-19, which has claimed over 450,000 lives so far. Around 10 potential vaccines are now undergoing human trials, according to the World Health Organization. Masoud Mu from China Media Group CRI Myanmar Department explained more on the vaccine development status in China. ဒီဟုတ်နိုင်ငံကြီးစံတမ်းနေတဲ့ပစင်းရောအကူလက်ရှိမှာတော့ဟုတ်ဟမ်းမှာစတင်စံတမ်းသုံးစွဲနေပါ
Just after the government's confirmation of the first case for COVID-19 in late March, public gatherings of more than five people have been banned since April. Currently, no local transmission has occurred since ATME, but over 100 cases tested positive for COVID-19 from the returnees from the second week of May until now. Most of the companies, factories, schools, shops and restaurants in Yangon have begun resuming their respective operations since the beginning of June, as the government has relaxed its healthcare restrictions gradually. The following are public voice from the different businesses speaking to MI Radio about the reoperation of their businesses and their opinions on whether Yangon gets back to normality. Ma'i Mo'a, a business development manager from Emera Digital Marketing, said, since the beginning of June, the staffs are attending the office again for two days in a week. We have divided into two assignments so the staffs can attend the office alternatively. We hope to operate our office with 100% in coming July. The reoperation situation of the businesses will be different from one business to another according to their source of business sector. I think that businesses will be back to normal situation after the danger. Gopio Josan is running a restaurant and cafe named Akino, he said. Our restaurant depends on the office staff customers. Most of the offices assign only 30% of their staff to attend office alternatively. So our sales can only grow by 30% of normal condition. I think most of the restaurants will be similar condition like us. Unfortunately, we've heard some restaurants kind of withstand the crisis and are shutting down. In my opinion, the rest restaurants will follow the right health care instructions consistently, let the customers feel safe and create the privacy for them. In this way, they can also pick up the sales quickly and the restaurants can survive and overcome the crisis. Jonathan Austria, who is an assistant general manager from Training Ground Fitness Club, spoke to MI Radio about the current economic conditions of fitness industry. He said, Before we have uh, good sales almost around uh, 80% of our target, now we have a 50% of our target. Uh, it's not similar like a normal uh, uh, situation. The most difficult now is uh, selling, selling membership. Uh, and also the difficulties now is uh, having direct contact to the clients because as a gym or fitness industry, we make sure the healthy and the right technique of the workout. And we make sure that our clients uh, receive uh, correct knowledge and correct workout from our trainers. So we need really very close intact, but we have to try to avoid that one. That distancing is also uh, uh, very difficult for all the personal trainers. But now we're trying to do educating the members by words using social distancing. According to Dr. Ten Hainsu, who is a spokesperson from MOHS, it could take years to end this epidemic completely and back to normality. The public need to be accustomed to new normal situation as COVID-19 is a long battle, he said. <laughs> COVID-19 control and emergency response committee have to decide the relaxings of the restriction by evaluating various points of view like national economy, politics, and so on. If we have to look at the situation around the world, the risk of COVID-19 is still threatening. It will take more time to end this pandemic completely. Even if the vaccination occur, it will also take some time to reach two countries. COVID-19 is a long-term battle for us. The current condition is vulnerable, and if we take the wrong step, the consequences are really threatening. 
During a video conferencing on the focus of comments, State Councilor Dong San Suu Kyi said that the risk of pandemic's second wave has to be concerned, even though the national economy has to be set off as soon as possible. I am Pio Di Ritu. This is news reporting from Emma Radio. That's the report on businesses in Yangon partly resume the operations. And now we move on to the last report for the day. The COVID-19 pandemic outbreak affects the global clothing chains, which are the major contributor to the Myanmar's garment sector. CTUM expressed concern that if international community presumes Myanmar garment workers are facing rights issues, it will affect the country's garment sector. The report covers the challenges garment and textile sectors are facing and the solutions the stakeholders are exercising. Aga Jo has details. The COVID-19 pandemic outbreak affects the global clothing chains, which are the major contributor to Myanmar's garment sector. The clothing chains had to shut down thousands of their branches as the pandemic gets six months old. The 13 big clothing brands employ Myanmar garment factories, and the impact on those major clothing chains is detrimental to Myanmar garment sector. Dr. Kai Kai Nui from Myanmar Garment Manufacturer Association explained that the number of garment employees who lost jobs amid the pandemic is very high. There are huge challenges that the garment sector has to encounter. Some count down the overtime working hours, some downside the workforce as there is no more work or the receipt. According to the data collected by MTMA, more than 6 million employees lost jobs and there is just data of the members of MGMA. Number of job losses could be higher if it is for the whole country. Despite the losses the garment sector employees are facing, the employees reportedly are better informed with the health knowledge now. The MGMA also commented that the employees are better disciplined wearing masks, using hand sanitizers, and receiving temperature checks. Do Kainza Aung from Confederation of the Trade Unions in Myanmar explained. Employees became more understanding. Before, the employees tend to react if they got laid off. But now they become more understanding that this is happening all over the world, not just in Myanmar. Now they realize that the survival of the factory is important and the employees tend to cooperate better now. We are also considering employing the workers on contract basis. For example, in Japan, when auto factory survived through the pandemic period without exercising the layoff. So we also want that to happen in Myanmar. But the thing is that the factories here are not properly following the guidelines set by the Ministry of Health and Sports. However, the good thing is that employees are better equipped with the health knowledge after the effort in raising awareness. Mask hand sanitizer are provided to the workers and food packages are provided to the workers who lost their jobs. It is reported that the workers can report and discuss their complaint through hotline number set for them. She also expressed concern that if international community presumes Myanmar garment workers are facing rights issues, it will affect the country's garment sector. The European Union provided 7.9 billion jets in cash to support the garment workers in Myanmar who have been affected by COVID-19. The Myangu Quick Assistance Emergency Cash Fund goes directly to cut, make, pack workers who have lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19. Factories in the country, especially those that manufacture garments and textiles, had already been facing unprecedented challenges since February as supply of raw materials from China stalled and importers from the West began slashing orders. Although the crisis is temporary, it could last at least three months. It is important for the garment industry to be prepared to start production when things return to normal 
by this year's peak season in August and September. Now, the government, the respective associations, international organizations, businesses, and the workers are in a bid to survive the challenges the garment sector is facing amid the pandemic period. This is Agajo reporting for Myanmar International Radio. That's the report on global apparel demand jobs and Myanmar garments. Now to international news. Russians are voting on proposed changes to the constitution this week. If the amendments are passed, President Vladimir Putin could be allowed to remain in power for another 16 years until 2036. But the opposition has called for a boycott. CGTN Dan Ashby has more from Moscow. Millions of Russians heading to the polls this week, and one of the fundamental points is the question of whether President Putin should be allowed to contest power until 2036. That is just one part, the main part, but one part of a whole packet of constitutional changes that includes whether President Putin should be allowed criminal immunity after he leaves office, uh, the question of gay marriage and whether it should be banned, uh, enshrining the word God in the constitution, safeguarding pensions and exempting Russia from some international law in certain circumstances when it contradicts the constitution. So there's a whole packet there uh, and people will have to decide either yes or no to all of the amendments in one go. They cannot pick or choose. It's all of them lumped in together. So far, uh, the campaign against these changes has really focused on Mr. Putin, made it a battle about him, saying this is effectively a coup and that it's unconstitutional in itself. It's undemocratic. But the campaign in favour of the changes has really focused on Russia itself. It's brought up pictures of famous Russian cultural stars, Alexander Pushkin, the poet, and Mr. Putin has been absent from that campaign. Uh, but I think one of the big questions is what will the turnout be? Because the leader, uh, Alexei Navalny, who's seen as the main opposition figure here, has called for a boycott. He says the whole referendum itself is rigged because of a history of uh, vote fraud in Russia and little has been done to stop that. He's calling on his supporters not to vote. Uh, but of course, the Electoral Commission here has promised that it will be a safe and fair election. They say they are working on all those cases of election fraud and they insist that it will uh, be free and fair. So people will be looking at the turnout. Of course, there's the coronavirus issue as well in terms of whether that will put people off. But this really does come down to the question for most Russians. Do they want to allow President Putin to have a go at governing uh, for another 15 years or more? The U.S. House of Representatives has approved a Democratic police reform bill. The bill mandates changes in law and policy to rein in police misconduct. It bans chokeholds, combats racial profiling, and establishes a database to track police misconduct. The Democratic-controlled House voted 236 to 181, roughly along party lines, but the bill may face a showdown in the Senate. President Donald Trump says the Democrats are aiming to weaken the police. Chinese President Xi Jinping and his wife exchanged congratulations with Dutch King Willem Alexander and Queen Maxima on the birth of a giant panda cub in the Netherlands. The panda named Wu Wen gave birth to a cub in the Ohan Zoo in the Dutch province of Utrecht in May. Wu Wen arrived at the zoo on April 12 of 2017 as part of an international breeding program. The cub is a beautiful symbol of the Chinese-Dutch friendship and an important achievement in bilateral cooperation in biodiversity conservation, she and his wife has said in a congratulatory letter. They noted that since the onset of the COVID-19 epidemic, the governments and the people of the two countries have helped each other and written a beautiful tale of friendship. The Dutch royal couple, for their part, said they were greatly delighted and heartened by the birth of the cop. The new life, they added, is not only a symbol of the fruitful relationship between the two countries, but also a contribution to the protection of global biodiversity. 
That's all with the news and reports on Myanmar Today Review. Tune in every Saturday on MITV at 8.30 p.m. for Myanmar Today Review. Until next time.